A woman was in a hospital in a small town. A minister from a church different than her own was a kind, friendly man. When he visited the hospital, he visited everyone there regardless of their religious affiliation. While visiting this woman, the minister offered to pray for her. She said that she would rather he wouldn't, since his prayers wouldn't go any higher than the ceiling. She was very proud of herself when she reported the incident to her own preacher. Her preacher was appalled and embarrassed. What is our attitude toward those who belong to a different church? Do we demonstrate a Christian attitude toward those who differ with us? Does the sin of pride hinder us from reaching out to believers in Jesus who may be in religious error? Our text today has an application to these questions. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. This story concerning the strange exorcist apparently concerns an incident in the life of Jesus' followers when he was not with them. Alan Black says in the context of chapter 9, verses 33 through 37, the story of the unknown exorcist portrays the disciples as acting directly counter to Jesus' instructions. They were urged to be last of all and servant of all and to welcome little ones with a spirit of humble service. Instead, they immediately demonstrate their self-serving interest by the way in which they approach the unidentified exorcist. Henry Fletterman said, Like the dispute about the greatness, about greatness, the episode of this strange exorcist reflects an attitude of the disciples that leads to conflict. In both cases, Jesus intervenes. The disciples' exclusivism is rejected as was their self-seeking. Well, we note that this is the only time when Mark calls attention to John alone. But here is John who speaks up, saying, We saw a man driving out demons in your name. We told him to stop because he was not one of us. Jesus' gentle rebuke of the twelve for arguing about and desiring what they saw as greatness must have been a bit embarrassing to them. It really sounds as if John is trying to shift the discussion to something he thought Jesus would commend. And John says we tried to stop him. That suggests they repeated their efforts, but they were unsuccessful in their attempts. David Garland said, the complaint, complaint drips with irony. The disciples only recently bungled an exorcism Yet they do not hesitate to obstruct someone who is successful, but who is not a member of their team. There's no question raised in the text as to whether the man casting out demons was actually able to perform exorcisms in Jesus' name. John, who here represents the others, we, was not concerned about the man as a charlatan or a false teacher. He was concerned because he was not following us. John's concern expressed the same attitude seen in the disciples' discussion of who was the greatest. Well, you might ask the question, well, why would they want to stop this man from casting out demons in the name of Jesus? And the answer, because he was not following us or he was not with us. In other words, he was not a part of our group. He's not someone we know. Here we have the age-old spirit of sectarianism. If you are not one of us, you can't be doing anything right. That is an attitude that plagued the Twelve and that has plagued the church ever since. Well, we ask, who was this man? 
The answer is we really don't know. Martel Pace conjectured, we can assume that this man had met Jesus, had come to believe in him, had been empowered by him, and had been sent out by him. The apostles were unaware that Jesus had done this. As we said, there is no indication the miracle wasn't real. It's possible that this man was one of the 70 Jesus had sent out earlier. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 17 says that they were able to cast out demons. But for the 12, regardless of who he was, he's not one of us. And so we tried to stop him. You know, there's a bit of irony there, isn't there? The disciples had recently failed to cast out a demon. They failed to do the same thing that this man had done successfully. He could do what they couldn't, but they tried to stop him. Well, Jesus condemns their sectarian spirit, verses 39 through 41. He lays down three principles for them and for us to follow. If someone does a mighty work in Jesus' name, he's not likely to turn against Jesus. Jesus says, probably using a familiar proverb of the day, if he isn't against us, we should consider him to be for us. The disciples need to change their attitude and recognize that even, even the value of a cup of water given to one who bears the name of Christ. Whoever helps or honors Jesus' disciples because they are his will by no means lose his reward. Well, John does not get the answer he expects by any means. Now, as we look at this brief text, there are some false conclusions that are drawn from this episode. We need to avoid those. Doing something good isn't a get-out-of-jail-free card for non-disciples. Some falsely believe as long as a person lives a good life and shows respect toward Jesus' followers that they will be saved. But back in chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, Jesus made very clear, if there is no discipleship, there is no salvation. Remember what he said, whoever saves his life will lose it? Or what profit would it be to gain the world but lose your soul? He said, if you're ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him in glory. <coughs> the reward Jesus speaks of doesn't include salvation without discipleship. And we might note that the reward here is really something besides salvation specifically. We are saved by the grace of God. <clears throat> Another false conclusion, just saying something is done in Jesus' name doesn't make it valid. There are ungodly charlatans and deceivers who do this all the time. If you have access to a religious TV channel or if you look on the internet, you can see men and women who are preaching, who are claiming to do all kinds of things in the name of Jesus. But their teaching is false. Their teaching is unbiblical. We have an example of calling on the name of Jesus to do something. It didn't work out well in Acts chapter 19, the seven sons of Sceva. Sceva was one of the high priests. <laughs> Seven sons of Sceva, for whatever reason, had decided they were going to cast out demons in the name of this Jesus that Paul preaches. In other words, they didn't have a very good connection here themselves, but they were going to attempt to cast out demons. And finally, the demons had had enough, and they said, well, you know, we know Jesus, we know Paul, we don't know you, and they went out of the person that they had possessed and went into the seven sons and gave them quite the time. No, it's not enough just to do something in Jesus' name. There are those who are wrong doctrinally. There are those who are wrong morally who will call upon the name of Jesus, but that doesn't make what they do valid. 
We need to remember that the name of Jesus is not some sort of magic charm that makes everything you want to do right. What the man that John and the others saw doing was a legitimate use of Jesus' name. Well, those are some false conclusions that people draw, but there are some valid conclusions that we should draw. One is good is good regardless of who does it. What about people who do good but whose teachings are wrong? It doesn't negate the goodness of their actions, and we should acknowledge them as good. There is an expression that someone made, I'd rather someone be an atheist than a member of another religious group. That's the same sectarian spirit the twelve had. I want people to believe in Jesus. There is no salvation without believing in Jesus. I believe some of those who believe in Jesus have been taught wrong and are practicing wrong. And with my current understanding of Scripture, I can help them. The shoe could be on the other foot. It could be I encounter someone who has a better understanding of the Scripture than I do, and they can help me do better. <coughs> Let's remember there is nothing wrong with acknowledging the good that others do. In fact, it's wrong not to do so. A second conclusion we should draw a friend is a friend, and we need all we can get. Jesus says the one who is not against us is for us. Sectarianism, that is, religious division, flourished when our society was dominated by Christian values and, world view, and a worldview. That's not so much the case anymore. Now, it's the world versus the Christians, and the Christians seem to be a much smaller group. No longer can we count on our government to favor Christians. It will do just the opposite. That's very much like a first century setting, don't you think? Very much like the setting in many nations of the world. All of a sudden, anyone who believes in Christ is to a certain extent an ally. He is a friend. We cannot afford a sectarian spirit. We need to recognize as allies everyone who doesn't oppose us or our message or our work or the gospel. We need all the friends we can get. Tommy South has made several trips to the Ukraine to do mission work. And he gave an example of those who are not of us, but who are doing good. He referred to the National University Austro Academy in Ukraine. They wrote and distributed textbooks in Christian history and ethics for use in public schools. He said it's a great work. They're doing a great work. He says, we need allies like that who can do things we can't do. Now, I'm sure Tommy would disagree with some of the things that that group does. He would disagree, perhaps, with some of their core beliefs. But he takes advantage of the good they've done. Now, this does not mean acknowledging that there are others out there who are doing good. It doesn't mean that we condone or accept all that others believe. We do recognize them as allies in our struggle against evil. <clears throat> there have been movements within Christianity against the forces of evil. And some people who differed on some very significant doctrines would put those things aside to combat the greater evil. We also need to remember that today's unbeliever may be tomorrow's disciple. If we encounter someone who differs from us in some basic beliefs, 
we can make that person an enemy because of a negative spirit. But there's a better way. The 12 could have responded to this exorcist by encouraging him to join them. Or if they felt it was needed, they could have taught him more accurately. If he was wrong in any of his beliefs, they could have taught him. We have a very clear example of this after, after the church begins. Two fine Christians named Priscilla and Aquila, a good Christian couple. They encountered a man named Apollos. Apollos was a powerful preacher of Jesus. But he didn't have all the information he needed. He had an incomplete message. He knew only the baptism of John and not the baptism of Christ. Well, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him preaching, they did not rebuke him. They took him aside privately and taught him the way of God more accurately. And Apollos went on preaching the gospel now with a complete message. We need to take the faith that people do have and build on it. We should not reject people because their faith is somehow defective. We need to remember that ours might be a bit defective too. All of us are imperfect people striving to attain the perfection that is in Christ. We are dependent upon the grace of God. We're dependent upon the blood of Jesus. We're dependent upon the righteousness of God. It really all goes back to what Jesus said earlier in verse 35 of this chapter. He said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Our task as followers of Jesus is service. Our task is not to always be evaluating other people. Billy Patton said, we need seed sowers, not fruit inspectors. Now, it is quite true that Jesus encourages us, commands us, in fact, if we see our brother sinning, to rebuke that sin, to encourage his repentance. It is, according to Scripture, our responsibility. If we see someone and we believe that they have an incorrect understanding of Scripture, the example of Apollos with Aquila and Priscilla, we have the opportunity, we have the responsibility to say, well, here's what I believe the Bible says on this matter. What the 12 had at this point <laughs> was pride. Pride in who they were. Pride in their group. Jesus had given them authority. They could do miracles. But they had a wrong conception of that. Jesus corrected that. I've had the occasion in recent years to be in the hospital a time or two. I was I probably had one of the longest stays ever for a gallbladder surgery because it took them a lot of time, does it? But if you're in the hospital, the hospital chaplain comes by and he will offer to pray for you. I don't know the religious background of the hospital chaplains for the most part. I don't know whether they have followed what I believe to be the New Testament plan of salvation. But when I was facing surgery, when Debbie was facing surgery, when others are facing surgery, I asked everybody to pray. Because who gets to decide which prayers go beyond the ceiling? We do well to remember the words of Jesus. He who is not against us is for us. One who does a work in my name can at the same time speak against me. 